Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a brand new series, Down the Boozer with RGM. Um, and we've got a special guest with us today, down at the beautiful castle uh, here in Manchester, Lee from Cabbage. How are you doing, mate? You all right? I'm very well, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, not a problem. Brilliant. So the, the album's out, we'll come to all that in a minute and we'll get to all, the, all that kind of stuff. But I was looking through some of my old car interviews um, and I was just looking through my old Clint Boone interview one and he, <laughs> cla- he claims to be the one that... That found you. I, I, uh, can't I came across that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, 2016, he mentioned, and he put you in touch with uh, a new level of management where you were at the time. So, what can you remember fondly, I presume, from them days and just doing whatever you were doing with Cabbage? Um, well, like we said many a time, it's a bit of a cliche, but yeah. the EP that we did was a bit of a joke. Cool. So it was more of a musical project that yeah. you know me and Owen and Joe were complete best friends. Yeah. And we just wanted to do a project together. <laughs> so once we put m- music to record, yeah. it, um, it eventually started snowballing a little bit. Everyone yeah. quite liked it, so we thought we'd put a gig on. And then we were going to sort of call it quits there, I think. Really? <clears throat> so anyway, Wh- we... Why? I don't really know. We, we didn't expect anything of it, you know, mm. the, the whole anti-band name thing of it. Yeah. We just wanted to experience that cathartic level of enjoyment that you get from performing. I always wanted to be a front man. Sure. I've recently just watched an Iggy Pop documentary which gave, which gave me the confidence to think I want to yeah. swap the drums for a microphone. Owen wanted to play guitar and Joe hadn't ever really been in a band. Cool. So yeah, it was more of a, a new experience for us where we just wanted to try it, I suppose, okay. rather than... So uh, I've always liked documenting and following the journey of a band and did you, did you never have... Did you never want the arena tours and all that kind of stuff and then? then uh, not really. I think we were a little bit disillusioned with music. Yeah, okay. Um, I th- definitely in 2012, 2013, I think music took a slight dip. And then on the cusp of us creating this band in 2015, yeah. I think there was a resurgence. And bands like Fat White Family exploded yeah. my mind, which yeah, yeah. completely turned me back onto music oh. wholeheartedly. Um, so, yeah, it was just a kind of a project that we wanted to kind of put together. Me and Owen spent two or three days tagging Manchester with posters for this one show that we were going to do. Yeah. And it eventually sold out. I don't know how the Colombian or South American students got a hold of this poster, but okay. they all turned up yeah. in, in numbers. <laughs> they must right. have just liked the poster and thought, sure. we'll, go, right. we'll go and check this out. Cool. And then uh, Clint and his wife, Charlie, they walk in. He's like, bloody hell, Clint Boone's yeah. that's, uh, that's th- that's a decent person to have at your gig. We played the show as we do, and then the next day we get a, we get a call off Owen saying Clint Boone really loved the show. He wants to big us up and he wants to put us in touch with a, a management company in Manchester who yeah. currently have quite a decent roster of Mancunian bands. Yeah. So then we spoke to the management and the next thing, we've got a booking agent, we've got tours, we've got labels wanting to speak with us, we're releasing singles, recording records. And so how was that mayhem in them days? You know, it, we all, when the business starts yeah. kicking in, I, I speak to a lot of people and that can be... Quite a daunting thing. Yeah, we tried very hard to be professional, but I think at the end of the day, it was yeah. always going to be a, a rogue car crash or whatever you can call <laughs> okay. it. We, but yeah, fair know. enough. Um, so, it, it, you know, our lives completely changed at that yeah. moment. And then all of a sudden we started, you know, all the uh, ambitions started sure. coming out as though we wanted to start putting them together. D- did you feel yourself or did you notice anybody particularly changing through that period, you know, when, when you were getting more offers? But did, did the personalities in the band change? Did egos uh, jump pork? I'd say know? we've always been pretty grounded. Yeah. Being, I mean, I'd spent years playing as a, as a drummer in bands in Manchester. Yeah. So the disillusionment of fame and fortune and ego yeah. always played on my mind for, you know, for, you know, it was what, a not to fall into that trap. Well, type. Yeah, it was a long period of time that I mm. spent trying to be a professional musician. Sure. And then, you know, all of a sudden, the, the table sort of turned with this one little project. It yeah. Kind of, it, it exploded. So it was always on the back of my mind not to carry yeah. any any kind of uh, attitude towards sort of ego ways. But you're going to have to ask some of the other bands. <laughs> if they, if they okay. feel the same, I don't know. Sure, they might, they might walk around with their, uh, their, their head held high, I don't know. Well, you're a band that's never been, you know, far from controversy. And I, I saw on Twitter recently, somebody were having a go at Wayne Lineker. Yeah, that was me, yeah. <laughs> was that you? Go yeah, on. yeah. What it's did he say? <laughs> he said something. It was, it's a bit was ridiculous, he ridiculous, weren't it? I can't it remember. Was, it was he applying for a girlfriend? Yes. He's got to cook and clean and whatnot. Yeah, he was being quite 
yeah. sexist and it was just yeah. it weren't nice. He's, I w- just, he's just a vulgar man, isn't he? He just needs <laughs> to take one look at I'm so s- I feel so sorry for Gary because he's done so, so well yeah. putting his, his good man personality across in, in all regions <laughs> of television, media and sport and he's got a brother like that, but you know. Because <laughs> it, it around about uh, just after the first album when you said that you feel like you're sometimes listed as public enemy number one as a band. Yeah. That's kind of a quote that came out. Th- do you still do you still feel that way? Uh, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say so much more mm. a, a, as it was, but I mean we've kind of taken a, a massive step back to focus on the album, and obviously yeah. we're not we're not on the forefront of touring as much mm. as we were anymore. I mean we kind of set we probably set that up for ourselves by targeting the biggest conglomerate newspaper. <laughs> One well, we didn't even target it again. That was that. We, everything we do is just completely accidental. Yeah, sure. It tends to uh, fling us from one place up to another. So that was kind of the, the sun championed cabbage, didn't they? And then yeah, you yeah. Kind of, you kind of, as you say about what you feel about that publication. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And what kind of what happened directly after that? What made you think, oh shit, what have we done? What have we done here? Um, well. It was on a New Year's Eve night and mm. I'd had a couple of beers before I went out and someone told me that we were in the newspaper and I just <laughs> reluctantly put a post up on the, uh, yeah. on the internet just think, you know, I've, I've been doing it for years. If yeah. I've ever had a problem, you get these, uh, <coughs> these keyboard warriors. Yes. I can't say I'm probably not one of them. <laughs> but if there was ever an issue, I've always felt yeah. obliged to post it on Facebook or sure. Twitter and this was just one of them but yeah. little did I know that we were building a lot of traction with the band so sure. a lot of people noticed it and then I got a call within four or five hours of like if you've seen your post it's going viral I'm like, are you joking <laughs> and then the management, <laughs> management are ringing up and saying bloody hell this is you know it's a mad world social media isn't it yeah. you, you, you can just say something that somebody takes offence to that you weren't meant that way but yeah. it, it's assumed by somebody yeah, a, well, a completely different way to what you mean it, and I'm not saying that particular one was. Yeah. But it was what it was, but it kind of did that. It's you know, we, isn't it? we offended some people who kind of took the messages the wrong way. Yeah. You know, we just we wanted to target a conglomerate that we thought at the time didn't represent northern working class people. Yeah. I've always felt like that. Everyone who's from an older generation mm. than me has always told me that. Yeah. So that's always been my political motives behind what we did. Um, but yeah, you know, obviously it did. It caused quite a stir. It is what know. it is, isn't it? It yeah. is what it is. We obviously weren't tagging any one person, sure. but you know, yeah. so it's, it's the way the way these things <laughs> happen. I suppose. It is, yeah. it is, and one band that I've always been fascinated with, just being an absolute fan all the way through my life, is Kasabian. Yeah, and you had the joy of supporting them on uh, as well. Any yeah. stories you can tell us about backstage with the lads, or um, not personal stuff? Because yeah. I know I, I want press for that, but just, just like experiences. And yeah, I mean, obviously Tom was going through a lot of mental mm. health c- t- sure. um, issues at the time, and he was obviously he had a he had a, a guard with him, I suppose sure. you could call him. Yeah. He made sure he was, you know, using his using his head as best mm. as he could. Serge was one of the loveliest men that I've ever met in my life. I met him in Vegas once. Did you? I, was I, went, to, I went to see Oasis at Hollywood Bowl. And he was Kasab- there. Kasab- Kasabian was supporting him. Oh, right. And next day we were in Vegas and I saw him in a bar and said, I'm fucking having a beer with him. Yeah. And he was just absolute sound. He still owes me 20 fags, actually, if he's oh, watching. Right. <laughs> but, but yeah, the absolute nicest bloke in the world. And Tom wasn't around, but I presume. Yeah. He just, you know, he ca- I think he can, you know, he's, he's got his issues, hasn't he? And I think he needs that protection around him with, yeah. with the fame, fortune, and ego. I don't know. But, sure. you know, that's what he needed at the time. So, but yeah, Serge. Yeah. Serge was always the quiet one, but he was always the one who had the best thing to say about you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, great to speak to a musical legend like that. And I, w- I want to ask, I just want to gauge, well, I've always had this fascination of what it's like behind st- backstage at big major festivals. <laughs> I don't know why, because it's, it's basically just a, a tent with some food in it and some beers yeah. in it, really. Yeah. But for some, some reason in my head, it's like this magical place where loads of good shit happens. Yeah. What's your view on... Oh, have you got any stories from behind the scenes and big stages or just having a laugh with the lads or whatever? I th- everyone's quite insular, mm. to be honest. It's almost like a school playground, but there's yeah. just musical celebrities everywhere and <laughs> okay. then cabbage in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, lo and behold, in about 10 minutes, you'll see Rev walking across the yeah. field because he's at every festival. And he's, <laughs> he's always the chief in-house. He's in control back there. Big shout out to John McClaw. Yeah, yeah. Um, good lad. Yeah. Yeah, we were, yeah, we were talking because that's cause that's how you knew about RGM, weren't it? You saw the car yeah. interview that we did with John. Yeah. Um, and I, I like picking down to earth, grassroots yeah. personalities really, because John John will admit himself he he turned into a bit of a wanky when Van got big. Right. But but he he, he knows that, and yeah. you know, and and he's just 
that's so down to earth and yeah. supportive of the music scene. The at recognition, the minute. yeah, yeah. It's just nice to see that, isn't it? I think if anyone's great on Twitter in a band, it's definitely them and him. They are it does not fuck gr- about on Twitter. They're great it? on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he was great on, was it uh, Piers Morgan? He was on, what was yeah. it? Was it Piers Morgan? Yeah, yeah. He was really good on that. Yeah, yeah great words to hear from a Yeah, he's, he's just so wise. For one so young, yeah. a couple of years younger than me, I think, brilliant. Um, so yeah, the first album, Young, Dumb and Full of, uh, full of, well, I'm full of Cabbage. Yeah, yeah. Dot, um, dot, dot, yeah. <laughs> you're going to have to help me with the new album name and the second album, Nihilistic Glamour Shots. Yeah, yeah. So like, you've got the second album out of the way. How, how, how was the second album for you to record and to get out there after the success of the first one? Um, well, it was a very, it was a very dark album, of course, mm. through the, the period that the band went through with the controversies. Yeah. And we were massively filled with hatred, and that al- that album personifies hatred, I suppose. Sure. Uh, we went through our own mental health issues, and we deal with a lot of really harsh subjects on that album. And I sure. suppose that was our m- antidote mm. to dealing with all the hatred and dealing with yeah. the pressure that we felt like we were under. Sure. And um, it, you know, for what it is and what it will stand the rest of time, it's exactly the way I want it because it, it expresses how I felt during that time. Yeah. And I think that's important about music to show. The, the the journey that the band I suppose go from if you listen to a band who've got uh, the fall are a great example yeah. you can you can listen to the falls albums and you hear the journey that the band actually went through the you know all the controversy and yeah. I suppose different members splitting and you know fighting and arguing you can sort of hear the change through the records yeah. we always wanted to mimic that so we always when we were recording an album we wanted to keep the music as topical as we possibly could sure. and modern and we wanted to express our feelings in the album as much as possible. Did, did you pick up a different type of uh, fan base from from going al- from from changing a little bit from the first album to the uh, second one? I'm not too sure. I mean, I was listening to a lot of Swans and all <laughs> that kind of really dark industrial Nine Inch Nails right. and stuff like that. And we sure. tried we tried experimenting with a more of industrial sound. Yeah. That's definitely the music we probably most listen to in the downtime. It's quite very, very <laughs> aggressive, like, yeah, yeah, f- cool. fiery music. But yeah, um, I don't think we ever saw a massive change in it. I mean, with the with Manchester, you always t- yeah. t- tend to get the same crowd of, sure. of, of die-hard fans. That's what Manchester's always been yeah. like. And I suppose, yeah, I don't, I don't think there was ever really a change in fan base. It's always no. been quite similar, yeah. Similar kind of yeah. base on there. Um, so what's your, what's your thoughts on how the government have dealt with this pandemic? Because we're all struggling uh, in the industry. We need help. Uh, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on how it's been. And I, I never thought I'd agree with Andrew Lloyd Webber. But when he spoke <laughs> about it's time to get the theatres open, I was yeah. like, yes, Andrew, I actually agree with yeah. you. Um, it's, it's almost terrifying and not to, you mm. know, create a massive dour note about it, but even with the football, you know, uh, not everybody's into football, but I think it's, a, you know, at least a massive part of our mm. economy and the way, sure. the way that British culture is viewed. Uh, obviously, theatres and, and uh, music venues are the, are the absolute lifeblood of culture, yeah. and it always will be. And I think it's massively crucial for the government to figure out a way to at least make it work, and I, I don't think that's a priority at the moment. He keeps talking about freedom and he keeps talking about culture, but I think they're kind of missing the point a little bit. But mm. th- uh, they're, so, they're so out of touch that they would never agree with thoughts of you know what I feel people would echo on the streets of Manchester. Yeah. He's got nothing in, <coughs> in common with Manchester and that's why we dislike him so much. Uh, but they always have that with the North, I suppose. Yeah. I've always, that's always a, a, a gripe I've had with uh, London-centric politics. Yeah. But... Um, I just think, look at the progress in Germany, France and Italy, countries that sometimes had a little bit of a worser impact of COVID, mm. and we seem to be the ones struggling now, this great power of, of yeah. Europe, this great power of the world, now seems to be struggling because of, you know, even down to local testing and tracing not being in, in, sure. in, in place properly. It, you can see it's now a, it's now seriously impacting not just a part of the country, but the whole country. Well, one thing, since I moved to Manchester a couple of years ago, one thing I have been impressed with is... Um, people like Sasha Lord, people that are pushing yeah. for the nighttime economy and just pushing and, and trying to get government officials yeah. to, to make, make it more a noise than what I'd ever seen like Sheffield or yeah. any other kind of cities. Um, so it does make me, if 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 Manchester's struggling yeah. and, and we've got this team of people that are pushing the government yeah. to, to make a call on it all, what, how is it going to impact the smaller cities as well? It's just it's worrying. Yeah, well, you don't even think about that, do you? Yeah. I mean, you know, 
to think about other, you know, you're so focused on your own city and your own hometowns yeah. politics that I, I believe you probably don't even take into consideration what what other smaller towns or cities have to t- have to uh, have to deal with it. But you know, this is definitely a nationwide issue. And yeah. if there's ever a time for people to include all of our all of ourselves rather than include some and forget the rest, yeah. I think that's probably an important message for people to take on right now. Hundred percent, mate. And what what kind of impact has it had on? You, Lee, and Cabbage overall? <coughs> um, um, I'd say probably the biggest issue is the fact that we've not played a gig since March. Yeah. Uh, that's been a little bit agonising, over the, especially now that we've started. When was the last one when you did, did you the is charity one at night and day? No, it's called Lafayette in London. It's right. a new venue. Annie Mack has got a club night down there, right. and we play with Blossoms at this new yeah, London yeah. venue called Lafayette. Uh, March 15th, I think it was. That's how wow. sad it is. I know the date because that's the last gig I played. It um, feels like five minutes ago, doesn't it? Well, yeah. That's, <laughs> you know, now we've started the album promo. And yeah. it's, it's out. It's yeah. more terrifying that we're not playing shows and not getting to experience that release. So <laughs> I suppose that's the biggest impact. I mean, in my life, I've got a little family. And, yeah. you know, it's been nice to have time with them. Sure. But, you know, I'm still in my 20s. I want to, I want to be working as yeah. much as possible. I want to be creating. I want to, you know, build my own personal empire, not to, yeah. to spread the empire over the world, but, you know, the empire that you build for yourself, to, yeah. you know, for your own well-being. I, you know, we, we want to pursue that and mm. uh, chase that as much as possible. So, uh, you know, we're all, we're all in this together. We're just going to have to hold on at the minute. But. So the new album then, it's out. Yeah. Um, so t- just tell us about how you've, managed to bring it out a new album recording it writing it just tell us a little bit about how it's come about um in itself i mean we always chase a brand new experience mm. uh, i suppose that was the the infancy of the band not having a uh, a long-term plan yeah i think we've always chased a little bit of a new experience so the young dumb and full of was always something that we always like it was like a a passion project mm. we wanted to get that first record together nihilistic gamma shots is an expression and this one we wanted to take the take the helm on everything you know we wanted to be the record label we wanted to be the producer yeah. we wanted to be the mixer we wanted to be the studio we wanted to how did that affect th- managing it just being the boss and the discipline of getting it all done and packaged yeah it's that de- i mean covid definitely helped with that because Full we, we had there. six months of uh, yeah. time to uh you know get everything finalized but w- when covid f- the f- sorry the lockdown first hit we were on the verge mm. of announcing the album right so it was about 7 days until we were announcing when right. lockdown happened so obviously we went back to the drawing board it was like we're going to have to put everything on hold mm. so that gave us a little bit more time to finalize everything and put it all together sure but yeah i mean it was just nice to be in control and i think that's what any musician Do you think really the album's wants. benefited from it's taken that extra six months. Uh, maybe now that we're pr- promoting it in mm. this uh, in this time, I don't think. I think it would have been terrifying to start promoting it in March and April when people were really at a yeah. standstill. Um, but I mean, n- n- now is probably the best time for it to come out. Yeah, definitely. Sure. So what's so? How did you record it then? Did we oh, oh, we recorded yeah. before the pandemic, weren't yeah, it? Yeah, okay, right, we so. built our own studio as well. Right, that was okay. another thing after, you know, with the money that we had left over from yeah. um, being part of the label, we we kind of invested it into building a studio, sure. which uh, massively paid off because now we've got the ability to record and produce mm. music whenever we want. We will eventually set it up as, a, as an actual working studio yeah. for bands and customers to come and record sure. in, but at the moment it's, uh, it's not top of the priority list. But yeah. Sure. It was nice to build that and, you know, not work to a bit of a, stru- I mean, you know, a tight schedule where you're in the studio and you, yeah. you kind of have to work to a budget and work to a schedule. You need certain things for yeah. fin- finishing up a certain day. It was kind of nice to have a bit of longevity because we'd never experienced that before. And of course, we've booked a tour for May next year, yeah. 2021. Finally, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. yeah. Well, everybody's, everybody seems to have pushed things back to kind of March when you yeah. see all the bands uh, moving the tours into next year. Um, just fingers crossed for it. I don't know what else to say. You know, know. What, what else can anybody say about what's yeah. going to happen? I'm trying to put on gigs to get cancelled. You move it a month or yeah. two in advance and you just keep rolling with the punches, really, don't yeah. we? Until we can just fucking have it on stage again. Yeah. I feel like when all the bands were announcing the September and October tours, mm. I was a bit miffed. I was like, yeah. why are we not doing that? And our management said they won't happen. Mm. And I went, all right, I'll... 
I'll leave that in your ballpark. Yeah. And lo and behold, they were right. Mm. So I do feel sorry for a lot of bands who yeah. put a lot of time and effort into planning. Uh, Takes the, the there's so much time tours. and effort yeah, that goes on behind the scenes, yeah, isn't it? That's the thing, you know. Tour is, um, you know, there's a lot of people who put in put into the work of a tour. Not only sure. just, you know, you don't. I think that some bands, I don't know how, how touched they might be, but I don't think some bands realise how much work actually goes into yeah. them. When you, you know, you've got a booking agent, and then you've got all the venues who have to contribute their own part of sure. it. But yeah, so it's a bit unfortunate nobody actually getting able to play gigs at the moment, but. Brilliant. Well, well done on a cracking album. Download it. Treat yourself, everybody, to the new Cabbage album. Um, Lee, thanks for your time. Yeah, today, no worries. Mate. Really appreciate it. Down social distance, down <laughs> at the Castle Hotel here in Manchester. Um, yeah, uh, is there any other, uh, anything else coming up that you want to mention? Um, uh, I suppose not really. But I, it, the best thing about COVID is, yeah. I imagine a lot of musicians have had a lot of time to write some more music. So we've got 100%. a foot up on yeah. the next record. You've already. got no excuses, basically, have yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. There's going to be a lot of good music released next year. Brilliant. Yeah. So, yeah, Lee, thanks again, mate. My name's been Carl Maloney. We've been down the boozer with RGM, sponsored by Scots Menswear, the beautiful people over there. Thanks again, and tune in for the next episode, which will be with you shortly. Thank you. <laughs>